Hello, this is Professor Teresa Pelkey. This is Session 3, Part 1, The Basics of the Select Statement. In this session, we'll get started with the SQL Select Statement. You'll do most of your work in SQL using variations of the Select Statement. This is such a big topic that we'll have several sessions and labs in this course for this statement. In this session, we'll cover the following. Part 1, the basics of the select statement. In this part, you'll see what some of the simplest select statements look like. Part 2, using column aliases. You'll learn how you can assign different names to the columns that show up in results of a select. Part 3, working with functions. There are dozens of functions that you can use in SQL to work with data in a table. We will look at some of the most commonly used functions. Once again, we'll be working with the world schema and its tables. This is the schema that was introduced in Lab 1. If you worked through Lab 1 and Lab 2, you've already seen some examples of select statements. The MySQL Workbench includes some features that will generate and run simple select statements for you. One of the simplest types of select statements is shown here. On this slide, you're seeing part of a query tab in the MySQL Workbench. Near the top of the tab, you see the select statement. The Workbench uses color coding for the SQL select and from keywords. You can also see the world.city schema and table name. On this select statement, the from keyword is used to specify the schema and table name that the data is to be retrieved from. If you haven't worked with SQL before, the most curious part of this statement is probably the asterisk character, sometimes called star. When used in a select statement, the asterisk has a special meaning. It means that all of the columns that are defined in the table are to be retrieved. When the asterisk is used, it is usually referred to as a select all statement. When this select statement is run in the workbench, it retrieves data from the city table. The data is displayed in the result grid part of the query tab. Data that is retrieved from a select statement is sometimes referred to as a result set. If you write a program that runs select statements, you'll use features of your programming language to work with the result set. What happens if you run a select statement and there is no data in the table? In that case, you have an empty result set. The statement is valid and it will run without error. There just won't be any results. What happens if you run a select statement, like that shown here, and there are millions of rows in the table? Using a statement like this, all of the rows in the table will be retrieved. In session five, you'll learn how to limit the data that is retrieved in a select. Here you see a variation of the select statement. The variation here is that three column names are specified rather than using select all. When you specify column names, data is retrieved only from those columns. You might wonder why you would want to use this variation. After all, it would be a lot faster to just type a single asterisk character instead of the list of column names. In fact, for most applications, it is always best to specify just the column names that you need. Some tables might include dozens or even hundreds of columns. It is unlikely that you need to work with all of the data in all of the columns. Although we don't emphasize performance and optimization in this course, it is considered to be a best practice to specify column names rather than use the select all. The reason why is because when you limit your column selections to just the data that you actually need, the database management system doesn't have to move as much data to get the results set ready. As with most performance issues, if you just try running a select all statement on your PC or Mac, you will not see any difference. It will be just as fast as if you had specified a column list. 
But if you run a database like MySQL in a server environment, for example, as the backend database for a web application, the cumulative effect of many select statements will be a factor. If a database-driven website is running too slow, one of the things to look into is if the select statements are select all instead of limiting the columns to just those that are needed. This slide shows the two select statements that were used on the previous slides. You can see the complete statements here. The table lists the words or symbols that are used along with a brief description of the usage. SQL keywords can be typed as all uppercase, as select and from are here, as all lowercase or as mixed case. Column, schema, and table names can usually be typed however you want, but there are some exceptions with names and different database management systems might have different rules. This slide shows the order of columns when a select all is used. On the left, you see the columns for the city table as shown in the navigator part of the MySQL workbench. The columns are listed in the order that they were originally defined using the create table statement. When you run the select all, the columns are returned to the result set in the same order going from left to right. In some cases, the order does not matter. For example, if you code a select statement to use in a web application where you are writing a program to display the results, you can usually control the order in which the columns are displayed in your programming language. Sometimes you will want the columns in a result set to be in a particular order. For example, if you are running a select statement that will be used to bring data into an Excel worksheet, you might want the data to be in a certain order. You can specify the column order that you want when you use a select with a column list. On this slide, you see that the select lists three columns, population, name, and country code, in that order. If you look at the table definition on the left, you see that the columns were not defined in that order in the table. When you work with MySQL Workbench, you'll usually be working with tables in a specified schema. Rather than have to type the schema name in the select statement, you can set a default schema. On the slide, you can see a section of the navigator on the left. You can right-click the schema name and select the Set as Default Schema item from the pop-up menu. On this slide, we are selecting the World Schema as the default schema. Once you select a default schema, the schema name is displayed in bold type in the navigator. If you need to work with a different schema for a while, you can use the Set to Default Schema again to change the default schema. There is only one default schema at a time. After you set the default schema, you can run an SQL select statement like the one shown here. Notice that the table name City, shown with the red underline, is not schema qualified. That means that we did not put world.city to identify the table. Because there is a default schema, the default schema name is used to schema qualify any tables that are not schema qualified. You need to be careful when you work with default schema, especially if you have the same table name in more than one schema. It is always okay to schema qualify table names, but you can use the default schema as a shortcut if you want to, but you do not have to set a default schema. Here is a variation of the select statement. This select does not have a from clause, so it is not selecting data from a table. Strangely enough, it does produce a result set. The strange part is, because there is no from clause, there is no table, and therefore, no column names to put into the select list. In this example, the two columns are named 1 and A. You can see in the result grid that there is a row in the result set, and that it indeed has two columns named 1 and A. You can also see that the data values for those columns are set to 1 and A. Here's another example of a SELECT statement that does not have a FROM clause. So once again, there is no table and no columns to select from. This time, though, you'll see that the data that is displayed is more useful. 
In this case, the columns that are specified on the select list are two MySQL functions, current date and current time. You can tell that these are function names and not column names since the columns both end with opening and closing parentheses. When you run this select, the current date and time are retrieved. The date and time are based on the system date and time, so if you run this on your machine, you'll see the current values on your machine. You'll find that being able to run a select with no from clause is useful for running quick tests of functions. Rather than have to work with actual data, you can simply enter the statement to test a function. Once you've seen how the function works, you can then use it in a statement that works with data. You'll be working with many more functions throughout this course. The two functions used here were just to show an example. In the next video, we'll look at how and why to use column aliases with a select statement.